Sure, I'm recording. Perfect. Give it about 30 seconds here. Let everybody tune in. Okay, perfect. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, week four, I believe, of our webinar series, uh, season three. We are kind of switching topics over the last couple of weeks. We tried to hit a lot of different things in this season last week with the, the carbon credits with Indigo Egg, and that is available. So if you guys wanna watch that, that is on our website and on our YouTube page. But we decided to switch it up a little bit instead of talking to another company. Uh, we wanted to, again, go back to the farmer and talk to somebody that is actually doing a lot of these principles and practices that we've been talking about. So uh, before we get started with that, I'll let you know that for those who are tuning in for the first time, you are muted and we can't see you or anything like that. But if you want to type out your questions, you can do that in the Q&A and the chat feature. We're going to have our presenter speak uh, till about 6.40 or 6.15, uh, about 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. So with that, Keith, do you want to go ahead and introduce our speaker? Yeah, I sure will. Thanks, Noah. Uh, our speaker tonight, as you can see on the screen there, is Lauren stein uh, We've known, you know, I've known, Green Cover Seed has known Lauren for a number of years now. I've had a great uh, relationship sharing information back and forth, being at each other's places. Uh, I had the privilege of being able to go to Lauren's farm last year. Uh, and uh, help out with uh, one of their workshops that they did there. And I'm sure Lauren will talk about this a little bit. Very, very passionate about educating and opening up what he's doing uh, to other people. Uh, just, just very generous in sharing the information. You know, if, if you had to, if I had to have one word to describe Lauren, I, I was thinking about this. I think the word I would use is fearless. I mean, you know, and, and you'll see this when he shows you these slides. He's just not afraid to try anything, which, which is great because many of us are probably a little more cautious than that. And uh, it's, it's great that, that we can learn from what he and, and others around him are doing. So uh, you can see on the screen there his contact information. Write down his email if you, you know, want to pick his brain about some of this. Like I say, he's very generous. Uh, the other thing, in addition to being a farmer, he's also part of the engineering team for Don Underground. Uh, which is great because he really has some good ideas on how to modify some equipment and a lot of the things that Don have brought to the market, uh, including the ZRX rollers, which we're using here on our farm and some of the other things have largely been uh, uh, tested and helped to be designed by Lauren and on his farm there. So uh, fearless, I think it's a great word to describe Lauren and, and what he does there on his farm in Northeast Iowa. And so Lauren, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna hide myself and uh, enjoy the presentation here. So take it away. Well, thank you much, Keith. Uh, kind of an honor being here when you uh, sit back and look at all the guys that you've had speak over this winter. And it's nice to see companies like Green Cover sticking to the education aspect that uh, it's what take, helps keep this whole thing rolling. And uh, when Keith says fearless, Okay, why aren't we, advanced? there we go. Uh, so I'm going to start off right here, give a little history of the background of Flolo Farms. On the uh, right-hand side, you see Flo, and on the left-hand side is me, Low. So, I mean, it's kind of a tribute. Uh, when I was 16 years old, me and Dad started a partnership, and it's just blossomed ever since. We, uh, through thick and thin, we've done a lot of, you know, He's the one that helped me get to where I'm at and inspired me to, you know, just give me opportunity to learn and educate. So uh, in January here, here, we were honored uh, with the No-Till Innovator Award for No-Till Farmer on the left. And then the right is kind of the future of Flolo Farms. This is my wife and three kids, Cassie, Kelly, and Rollin. Most of you have probably heard about Rollin. He's down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Kelly, the middle one there, is our oldest daughter. She's uh, worked for FSA, but she's the mother of my first little grandson. 
And then on the left side here, we got Cassie. She's the youngest. She's the one that told me many years ago that she's going to kick me out of here. So I'm waiting for that day yet, but we're getting closer all the time. Keith brought up about Dawn equipment. Uh, that is kind of why I took the position at Dawn. I'm getting ready to step out of the management op of the farm here and hopefully turn it over to the kids as they start taking root here. But uh, I mentioned the Innovator Award. It, it meant a lot to me, but this slide right here means a lot more to me, especially when you see down here, I guess I'd call it the magenta or the purple fields. That's two of our fields represented there. So when people talk regen ag and stuff like that, we're starting to finally get the proof and the, the data behind us to help show that uh, we're actually doing what we're saying we're doing. And uh, I'll touch on this slide, I think a little bit later, but uh, I should back up here a little bit. If you guys haven't got your copy of the Soil Health Guide from Green Cover, you should probably focus on that a little bit. We're on uh, page 14, I think, it, or 16. That's, we're gonna, we're gonna let a lot of specifics go towards that. If you wanna understand and learn more, we're gonna have Q&A at the end, just let her up. I mean, I, I'd rather ask the questions. That's why we're just gonna give a brief general overview of what we're doing on the farm here. For context, where the star is, where, is where I'm at in Northeast Iowa. The, the key point I always like to point out, this 145 to 140 days of growing season. When people stop and ask why stuff works or why it doesn't, you know, why does it work here, it doesn't work there, this is one of the key things backed up by some of the other logistics of where we're at. We're 43 degree north latitude. A big thing is the 36.6 inches of rain. I was in a meeting in South Dakota there this winter and I, you know, they, they kind of looked at me a little funny when I told them, you know, our version of a drought is their wet year. And, you know, factor in the snowfall, you know, I, we got average of 38 inches, but I think I heard the other day we're over 45 already or something like that. And then uh, another key point I always want to point out is my farm is right here. If you can see on the pointer, we're right on the edge of the glacial till line. And uh, the biggest thing that affords us is we, we've got some very diverse soils. We go anywhere from pure gravel to pure peat in the same pass on all our, you know, in some of our fields. And I always like to throw this one in too, just to remind people, we didn't start what you're gonna see all today. This is not where we started. We started out pretty simple back in about 2006 is kind of when I started learning about interseed cover crops. I started out with these tools and uh, you know, we, we put a lot of miles on them things. We, I actually wore one of them out and uh, it gave us a lot of opportunity to learn small. So by the time we started going field scale, we had a pretty good idea of what to do, when to do it. Uh, in 2006, we were a corn on corn operation. So, you know, cereal rye was not an option for me at that time. Interseeding is cut, what I tell people was my gateway drug. That was where I really focused on uh, learning how to adapt cover crop, crops to work in our situation. But the biggest thing we learned very quick was the, the value of understanding the herbicides and the chemicals. You know, we had, Callisto was my favorite at that point, but we learned very quick that uh, we just, you know, when a product says two to three weeks of residual, you might see things up to two to three months later. And, and uh, you know, this uh, clover in the middle here is one of the aha moments that I had. As bad as that clover looked that year, I mean, this, this was seeded late August herbicide was applied in April or May. It frost, every time we had the clover come up, it was just frosted white, but that clover did survive over winter. Uh, another thing I really like to focus on is I'm a kind of an iron and steel guy. You know, th this, once we started seeing a little success, 
I had this toolbar that uh, we, we put 10 different styles of row units on there just to figure out exactly what we wanted as we went field scale with some of the interseeding. The biggest thing we learned very quick was a drill opener was gonna be critical. So when you hear guys like Steve Groff and that say, treat your cover crops like a cash crop, I, I you know, we, we were playing with drones and stuff that you'll see later, but uh, soil to seed contact is still hard to beat. And that's what helps us get the seeding rates and the su success that we see on our operation. Uh, you know, everything I build, we, we focus on serviceability. You know, when we overhauled that 10 acre drill that time, you could tear the whole drill apart with a 15 16 and a 9 16 trench, basically. So in field, if I got to work on it, it's pretty simple. I always have fun with this picture. The day that shop, that drill rolled out of the shop, happened to be a photo shoot here that day, but uh, we never get too attached to something because six weeks later, this is what the drill, you know, we tore the drill all the way down again and rebuilt it because I started understanding what twin row and stuff like that could do as we're starting to look at the relay cropping in that. And as I call it, we look at precision covers now is kind of everything we do in the fall. All our fields are set up for relay or the interseed cover crop. That drill got sold shortly after we overhauled it and uh, gave us the opportunity, you know, 2016, I kind of debuted this slide that uh, you know, I had it in my mind. I was the first time I was going to be able to afford to build all new from ground up. You know, so we, I wanted to start with a liquid side dress frame, had a Montauk seed box for or fertilizer box for seed, and then we based everything on the Dawn Duo seed row units. Here's what that rig looks like today. This is kind of what we've done a lot of the testing with, and that for the you'll as you'll see later the in row roller and. Uh, it was one of those tools, once we finally built it, we realized we had kind of the, the ideal tool for almost everything we wanted to do on our, you know, outside of the norm on our farm. You know, it sets us up for the cover crops, the relay crops. Uh, we apply fertilizer with it if needed. You know, we side dress with it if needed. You know, the, I, at this time, I'm probably down to 750, 800 acres, but that drill some years goes over 3000 acres just because it's so versatile. When we're talking interseeding, this is what I call success. You know, and as you listen to guys in that, the first question I advise most of the time is ask them to show pictures of success. You know, over the years, this is what some of our seedings have looked like and we're, we're getting pretty good at making it consistent. Oh, May 2015 is kind of when we started play, focusing back on more non-GMO stuff. And the first thing we realized was the, the value of a herbicide band for residual. We, we apply about a 10 inch band of residual right on the row and then we treat in between the rows separate. But I, I always like to keep this one in there to show guys just how simple stuff can be. You know, we, we banded uh, chemicals up until two, or 1988 was when we first started, uh, we were banding everything at that point. Never really used broadcast spray at that point even because we'd cultivate everything. So when I, when I figured out we needed to go back to banding, it was just a natural transition for me. But the biggest thing is we, you know, we didn't have the box planters anymore or stuff like that. So we just made our own little bracket and that's still in use today. Uh, another thing we learned over the years, delayed termination. You know, I'm, that goes back to that 43 degree north latitude. We won't get the tall cereal rye unless I'm gonna wait till June 15th to plant corn. Northeast Iowa, our optimum dates about April 20 to May 1st. So we're going to go ahead and plant the crop and then take it out later. And some of that goes back to when I started seeing this. I'm always out in the field scouting and this is kind of the field where the in-row roller was conceptualized because 
what you'll see here, if you can see the cursor, is the tram lines and stuff were all controlled traffic. But I always started noticing where our tram lines were, the, the weeds or the CRI, and that was easier to control. But uh, back to the air seating a little bit here. Everybody wants to talk timing. And, uh, you know, for me, we're going to be in that V3, V5 range. But it, we're going to factor it with the forecast. I mean, if we're looking at going hot and dry, I'll take my time. If we're going to be cool and wet, you know, we might push a little bit. All depends on the stage of the corn and how the corn's growing at that point. I always like to throw this one in there just to, you know, everybody asks, I can show you better than, than uh, tell you what I'm doing. So we always have fun with this one saying, uh, John Deere built the high speed planner. We built the high speed drill that goes in between. it. But there you can see, I mean, that's what I would call V4 corn. And we're in that kind of, when that corn's going to jump, that's when we're going to get it out there. The key to making interseed work in my mind is getting it out there early enough so it's established solid before you go into that dormancy stage. Uh, this is a Jill Clapperton slide for some of you that know her. The big thing we're trying to show here is when we talk about uh, moisture sharing or nitrogen sharing between some of the legumes in the corn, what you'll notice here on the right is how the roots are coming straight across into the inner seed area. Where over here, where no inner seed is, the roots are basically going straight down. Uh, inner seeding uh, on the most I've ever spent for inner seeding is $15 an acre in seed. And uh, history would show back when we were testing, we could, we could gain about 15 bushel an acre. But the biggest thing I'm focusing on anymore is the seed cost is ir irrelevant if we're starting to get multiple years out of the cover crop. To me, in the fall, this is the day we combine. This is a su successful stand. And then for the livestock guys in the audience, this is, you know, some of my neighbors thought I sent that year bailing all the residue off, but it was kind of a test. I had a dairy that wanted to buy corn stalks for bedding, and the way it turned out, the quality on the corn stalks with all the cover crop in there was so good that uh, all these bales went into the feed line versus the bedding line. With the cover crop in there, I'm not as afraid to bail the residue off because we've got the erosion control and all that right there. The biggest thing is we just got to treat it like another cash crop in my mind. Uh, when we got a good stand like that, you know, a lot of guys worried about the residue overwintering and stuff like that. The only way I can describe this is the greenhouse effect. You know, if we got enough heat in the fall after harvest, that'll canopy over and it the residue underneath that canopy just like it breaks down and you know it's a combination of the canopy and the nitrogen from the legumes in our cover crop With that we're going to jump right into the relay cropping and that because you know once we started figuring some of that out about 2014 i met a guy named john coots and uh he was planting soybeans in between his wheat you know, and as I was starting to figure out how we're going to get small grains into our operation, that was just a natural fit for me because we already had the drills. We had, you know, it just fit and worked. You know, here, here's John. That's that was back in about 2014. This picture was taken, I believe. I mean, that he's using a John Deere row crop head. But, you know, you'll see that, but we're going to show you a simple, cheaper ways to kind of try to get into this stuff. You know, you don't have to spend the money right away. Focus on the principles, make it work before you spend the money on the iron if you can afford, you know, as you build. Uh, here, 2016, we had, uh, we were working with Iowa Soybean Association and they, they had a program with Ag Solver that they were helping us manage our data just to try to see what, what was working and what's not working. 
I always like this slide because you'll notice right here on this little chunk, 25% better return on investment than a field of 234 bushel and acre corn. I don't know about you guys, but that gets my attention. You know, how, how, you know, we should be able to make pretty good money at 234 bushel of corn, but if I can do 25% better return on investment, I'm gonna start pursuing that. And that's why we've really started focusing on the relay and companion crops. This is kind of what we start off in the spring. On the left, we've got uh, cereal rye into soybean stubble. On the right, we've got uh, spring malt barley with uh, food grade soybeans. This is generally what uh, it'll look like as we're putting the beans in. This is an old IH cyclo simple planter on a shifting hitch. This is uh, the second relay, you know, originally we were using the duo seed drill for installing the beans on the relay crop, but uh, biggest problem we were having with the twin rows soybeans was clearance on the combine tires. So that, that's, and then when we went food grade soybeans, the, we were down to 18, 1900 seats per pound on the beans and the, the Montauk meter would have made bean meal out of it. So the old cyclo was just a simple fit. Sad part is I like it so much that uh, we plant all our beans with it now. For 2021, we're kind of shifting gears again. I'm not gonna rely on the shifting hitch. I bought another tractor here and we set this one up on 90 inch center. So we will be able to, we, I won't even have to shift A, B lines now. The biggest reason I want that is I got enough other stuff going on. I want it simple. You know, this old girl, I can stick my wife in and let her plan if needed. Come harvest time, this is what it looks like. Was, this is where we kind of started. You know, I originally I was using John Coots's blocker guards. Then we, this is just a simple ideal to fix the problem because John's guards were steel. I really didn't like the steel out in front with our undulating terrain. We, we tend to bend stuff and metal out in front of a sickle is not a great ideal. Come on. Where's my mouse? Heck of a time for the computer to freeze up. Come on. There we go. This is, uh, now we're, now we're looking like an amateur here. Sorry for pushing here a little bit, but here, here's the, these are just pieces of drain tile that we slit and slam over the cutter bar to uh, just block that where the soybean is, push the bean down. So we were just cutting the cereal rye. Air reel is pretty critical on stuff like this. Kind of keeps the sickle running clean when you're running the blocker guards. But uh, fast forward, uh, this is uh, July, 2020. We finally got all the pieces of the puzzle in place. That's this year we're kind of geared up. You know, my original plan for 2021 was I wasn't gonna plant an acre of corn, but uh, I kind of want to wait to the end here so you can see what we did on the, this is a 1253 deer head. Biggest thing we did here is we shifted the window on the feeder house. You can see the little about 15 inch shift on there. So the whole head is shifted to the left. Interceding soybeans seems to be a hot topic. Everybody's trying to figure out we're still trying to figure it out. I thought this year we were set up for about the best success. I was going to try to relay buckwheat in, but these, you know, we went two weeks no earlier than I ever have. But uh, the cover crop just, or the beans just hit that growth stage and they smothered the buckwheat out. So we kind of had a failure this year on that. There again, it's going to come back to timing, especially with the buckwheat and that. Ideally, G July. 20th is the cutoff date I would say you know this year I went July 7th without the relay thought we were hitting a window but just didn't work out this is a couple years ago the day we harvested the relay 
rye. We've chased the combine with the drill, installing uh, buckwheat here in the soybeans. This is just a close up view of what, that's what the beans look like with the rye in there. This is, I'm just gonna show you a little progress, kind of neat. I used to have the dates on here, but uh, here we're six weeks in already and you can start to see a few flowers on the buckwheat. The biggest thing we learned that year is the, we were drawing in the beneficials. We never had to spray insecticide on the beans or anything like that. There, they're starting to come more flowers. There's full flower. Always don't want to, everybody talks about the timing aspect of it here, where the down here on the bottom half where the, we drove the soybeans down, the beans were a little stunted. You can tell they're greener up on the hill. They matured normal. The buckwheat matured right with the soybeans that year. There's what it looked like the day we combined. Just take them both in and uh, separate them out. As we bring, bring them back to food grade uh, soybeans and stuff like that, 2018, we had buckwheat show up on every acre from the interseed mix the year before. Called the processor and uh, he said, no worries. So to me, if we can get buckwheat in our, all our soybeans, we're pretty happy anymore. Usually I don't like to share too many dollars and cents because once upon a time, a guy tried to tell me I was lying. So I, I, I'm a little careful on some of this. I try to, you know, how many of you guys can grow 30 bushel rye? Can you grow 30 bushel soybeans? Mix them together. And uh, like that year we had uh, 400 pounds the acre of buckwheat at 30 cents was wholesale at that time. You know, 820 bucks basically was our break even, but uh, history would show we can pretty much double the numbers on the soybeans for sure, if not the rye too. Uh, earlier I mentioned uh, perennial cover crops. This is last year, two years ago, I think it was. Yeah, this is two years ago. We've been managing this clover since 2016 in, in the field through some of the, you know, we're, we even get wild, we used Gramoxone in there and all that. But uh, when I showed that slide earlier, here's some of the field data. Field one is actually the, when I talk about the perennial cover crop, that's field one. The uh, field two is the buck soy field that's had basically a living root of that one since 2014. I'm gonna go back and point a few little things. Here is our water stable soil aggregates. You can tell the light green is our two fields now. The perennial forest is the blue. So that's kind of what we've been gauging against. Here we've got the organic matter, shows we're right on par with native soils organic matter. And then our bulk density, we're coming down. I'm pretty confident we will actually be down in that one more often than not. Than not. This is the perennial field. That's the day he was collecting the samples. This was also a test strip for the in row roller. The biggest thing we noticed between the early termination with the gramoxone and in row roller was about 40 pounds of nitrogen difference. On the left, we generated 40 pounds of nitrogen. On the right, we generated 80. And that year we had $8 herbicide program on that field between the herbicide ban and a third rate of gramoxone in between the rows. Okay, so when everything don't go perfect, this is 2016, we had the ideal for the interroller roller I had thought it was going to be a total failure that spring. You know, Joe was out here that day even, and well, we hurry up and hit everything with Gramoxone after I seen the roller wasn't going to work the way I thought it was. And with non-GMO corn in here, we had one field that didn't want to die. So mother nature decided I needed to figure out the in row roller. And about two, three weeks later, the CRI just kind of kept coming back. So we hit it. You know, cereal rye here was about 
four or five feet tall. The corn was about six inches tall in this picture. It, you know, 200 acres kind of, uh, you lose a little sleep one night. And uh, we finally figured it out about two o'clock in the morning. I went out in the shop, started tearing the drill apart. Six hours later, we were in the field saving a corn crop. Well, we're, you know, the, the cereal rye was starting to go down over top of the corn. And uh, anybody that's had rye and corn knows they're not very good, fr good friends. So we knew we had to pull that corn off. And I finally figured out I had the right pieces all along. I just bolted them on wrong on our first run. Here was a couple years later as we started getting it tuned in a little better. In this video, the soybeans are about six inches tall in there. And as we pan around back, you'll see we're just laying it right down in between the bean rows. So we don't, you know, knowing what I know now, I would have probably harvested that field as rye, but you know, that spring, the rye just looked like heck. So we didn't even worry about setting up for the relay. And that, that's one thing I always try to emphasize to people, what we're all doing looks crazy, but it, it gives us options. You know, as we see mother nature unfold her hand, it gives us options. And there, there's kind of how the simple setup was. That's what we started with. You know, just a simple, we turned the closing wheels into basically a wide roller. Now this year, this was fresh hot off the presses last week. This is the new in-roll roller. I just ordered mine last week. I'm actually gonna have a field scale one here, hopefully in a couple of weeks. But uh, there, there's when we debuted that one for production. Oh, the 60 inch corn time. Many years ago, I ran into this guy named Bob Recker. I think he's probably on the call. Hopefully he's smiling about now. He's probably sit, drinking a second glass of wine. But uh, I always go back to this was what he called his barcode plot. And, and uh, one, one thing when you work with Bob on stuff, he backs everything up with data. So when you start looking at some of this stuff, this is, you know, hopefully, hopefully sometime you guys have keep Bob on the call here and let him go at it for an hour. But you really see the edge effect emphasized on these. This is data from his barcode plot. But uh, what, from my experience, what I started noticing on some of our hill farms and all our waterways and that, I started with our electric drive planner, I could uh, bump the outside rows. You know, his data would show we never got more than three, the effect more than three rows in. So we'd set the outside row at uh, 45,000, next row at 40,000, the third row 35,000, and then variable rate the rest of the planner, usually in that 32 to 34 range. The, the next year we entered into a tram line study plot. This was kind of the first field that I know of that was prescription tram lines. As you'll see, things weren't quite lined up right, but uh, learned a lot from this plot. And the biggest thing we took uh, the one row out and then we moved that uh, to the outside, the next two rows. So we ended up with 54,000 on either side of the 60 inch gap. The rest of the field was a variable rate. But the biggest thing we noticed that year was the value of the cover crop in between the row in the 60 inch gap. And uh, the following year, I, I had the crazy idea that I'd go 30, 60. And, you know, Bob always points out that uh, the biggest error to my thinking was we were wasting the third of the soil surface with the 30 inch gap there. And this is just an aerial view of it. And, you know, the biggest thing I learned out of this aerial shot and why I always like to keep it in there is you can tell we were stressing nitrogen here because you know, when we did this plot, we didn't change the nitrogen and stuff like that yet. This is just an overhead view. If you look real close, you can see bare dirt here versus the cover crop in the 60 inch rows. 
And then this is Bob's money shot, I think he always calls it. This is where you really started seeing the value of the cover crop and the biomass that we could generate side by side, a 60 inch row versus a 30 inch row. Same seeding rate, same date seeded, everything. Back to Bob's data. You know, a lot of guys ask, you know, can we match yields with the 60 inch corn? You know, here we're showing 200, this is on one of Bob's plots, 230 bushel an acre corn. All right, here's the first check of the uh, 60 inch. This is a two row skip one, 230 bushel an acre corn. This outlined one is 60 inch corn, 238, 223. So we're, we're kind of right in that average. One of the things we looked at why we're into that is uh, I had the, the bright idea that we should probably be grazing that. But I got the little caveat that I can't be around livestock. So twice I fenced off the plot and the guy backed out on me the last minute. So I'm, I'm not really too enthused about fencing fields off again. But what that has kind of led to is where we're at today. This was this summer with Bob, we built a little drill that he can now go down through the 60 inch rows and seed. What I foresee doing, that's gonna open some doors for us. You know, we had already put the inner seed cover crop in there, but now we can set up for, this is Bob's little, I think, I think we scared Bob that day. He only made two rounds on there and decided to quit because the open pollinated corn with all the wind we had this year did kind of take a beating. But to me, this shot right here made it worth all the drove down corn. Because one of the biggest problems we have where I'm at is we, we're pretty limited to cereal rye. We can do winter wheat if we hit the right year, but uh, getting winter wheat to overwinter some years is a challenge. Just for the simple fact, we can't get it in soon enough. So now, if I can put the, use the 60 inch corn to get my cereals in all the way, I think we ran this year, September 1st, we might even push ahead into August. That's gonna open the doors for winter malt barley and stuff like that, you know, more high value crops again. This is after harvest shot and, you know, th this, is, this is where I wanna get to now. You know, if we can start getting them cereals in soon enough, we can get some substantial growth in the fall and get a decent stand come spring. On the Dawn side, one of the fun projects we've been working on quite a bit is uh, the inroll or the Romos. You know, this just shows the three different versions that we played with. It's going to be a very good option someday, but right now it's a very high dollar option. You know, the, the biggest thing we're learning is the horsepower demands is critical. And we got to figure some of that out. You know, in the middle here, we have, uh, in the middle here, we have the first one that was more of an impeller version with three, three rows on it. We could drain the sump on a deer 20 series tractor. So then we went the other direction on the left here to minimize the power requirements went to kind of a sickle. And as pretty as this one is, it ne did, never did make off the test stand, but another option we learned through some of the testing is we're gonna, we can mow in between the rows, but eventually we're gonna need to mow over top of the rows. Just to try to figure out the horsepower requirements on the right here, we actually had Honda gas motors and that's one of those deals I tell people that we've done a lot of crazy things, but I've never tr been truly afraid of a piece of equipment to that one. You got 70 horse of Honda power back there. It gets entertaining. 2020, as most of you know, was kind of an interesting year. We, for me, it kind of stepped backwards into working with Dawn here. This was ended up being my babysitting project this past spring. The first Black Dawn one, 24 row, ended up about 25 miles from my place. And it, it got me to start thinking about how much transition we've learned over the years. You know, up until 2015, we were strip tilling, stuff like that. It was kind of interesting going back to 
talk to these guys, you know, their first year diving in right in and uh, just kind of comparing notes where I was at then versus where I'm at now. Another opportunity we had this summer, we started working with uh, 1-3 Design a little bit. Uh, they asked for some advice. So I got to go out and see the day this thing rolled out of the shop. One of the fun, fun backstories behind this one, they actually had to wait for a Tesla to get wrecked so they could buy the batteries off of it. This is all battery powered, this one is. Another little fun project. We've been, the last two years, we've been a judge for Ag Launch and Innovation Contest with uh, Farm Journal Magazine, which is, I, I, it's kind of fun to see some of these upstart companies up and coming just grow and blossom over the years. And, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of starting a mentoring network now that uh, it's just going to open some really fun doors to see some of these companies thrive. Most of you guys have heard of Rantizo. This is one of their successful companies. You know, here last fall, we were setting up plots. So we're gonna have a plot. We're gonna run the drill versus the drone versus hopefully the robots will get me back this summer. Last spring through with Dawn, we had the first, uh, this is a, the robot here. We put a row unit on and they were actually gonna go out and plant corn with it. Here it is in my field this fall. We sent it down through the corn. It was a little later than I wanted to be, but testing wise, we ended up seeding about 50 acres of corn cereal rye this fall. This is it running down through the field. I'd say they got a little work to do yet, but it is kind of neat to see some of that, you know, some of that stuff is going to be in the field before we know it. And, uh, but I, I keep going back to, you know, which, which is going to be the better option, stay with 30 inch corn and get the robots in there, or keep it simple and, you know, autonomous Bob, we can sneak down through the 60 inch rows, which we can do this all today. Oh, our organic side, this is, I always like to keep this in just because this is going back in time for me about three years ago, we were challenged to start a organic plot. And this was kind of in preparation for the first testing on the Romo, but uh, we rented a little piece of dirt and we frost seeded clover out there first week in April in the snow, which led to the ZR, we had the ZRX here that, uh, we rolled the cover crop and planted at the same time. Now I wish I'd have seen what the plot was before. You'll notice there's an awful lot of grass in here for organic corn. Probably not the ideal setup, but I'm kind of bullheaded. We're gonna make a few, you know, we might as well learn from the worst case scenario so much easier than learning from the optimum situation. One of the things we learned over the years is always have a backup plan. So, you know, I re referred to the one as the Romo one, two, and three before. Here's, here's kind of the precursor backup plan when the Romo doesn't show up in time. And, uh, you know, I always, I, this, this is probably one of the ugliest plots I've ever been involved in, but this, this field is turning into probably some of the most educational corn I, that I've ever had the chance to. You know, you'll see up in here, this is my ultimate zero plot, but you'll see the corn's a little darker up here. You know, and as we're watching this, we're starting to see the fairy rings that everybody talks about and that. That would be our fungal networks and that starting to generate, you know, produce nitrogen and stuff like that. There's gonna be a lot of room to learn stuff here yet. You know, this is later in the season. It still don't look the most glamorous, but, uh, shocks people when you know get up here out of the edge rows and that we actually are hitting 200 bushel an acre corn with zero inputs and that that's where we had the the Ro romo running in there you know there's the intro roller but that there's where that corn ended up looking like that fall not bad for zero inputs 
this is now getting expanded as you know last year we had our first full certified organic field but we're going to keep pushing the boundaries so one of the things i want to know as we're building equipment i want to know what the competition is doing so we, we tested all the organic herbicides last year and i can guarantee you we didn't make any money on this field but there again it was kind of educational and as history would show we were not happy having perfect setup you know this spring we had a very late frost well this this field has up to 15 percent slopes and the bottoms were froze dead and the tops were green yet so i knew we need we kind of needed to even things out so i had a guy come in and bail the field off for me but as you can tell he didn't quite do a very good job of cutting the hay off. Let's see where it's, I got to keep pushing here, but uh, this here just shows all the different, you know, first couple were organic uh, fatty acids. I will not recommend them. Here we hit it with the weed slayer. You know, it, it fried it pretty dead, but it goes back to watching them tram lines again. You know, there you can see how the tram lines constantly are easier to kill and control. That's why, you know, biggest mistake we made on this field this year was we, we lost our residue mat. And that's the big difference between this field. You know, we averaged 130 on all our organic corn this year, but you can see all the trees around there. We're losing quite a bit on the end rows to deer. And, uh, you know, here we had to pull out the hooded sprayer again, try to rescue that. You know, this is one of those days we thought we we thought we saved the world again. But as history would show with these, you know, some of the this was a fatty acid again. You can see this stuff greening back up. And then this is the day I kind of like, oh crap, we're we're in for a battle. So don't be afraid to swallow your pride some days to save a crop. You know, we did pull a cultivator out. We did, did what I would consider the old ultimate sin. We did have to cultivate to save the crop, but uh, this is what the corn looked like come harvest. I'm gonna jump ahead here. There, there's the biology jumping. But uh, here, here's where I see the biggest opportunity coming. You know, th three years ago, I kind of had the crazy idea to start playing with uh, open pollinated corns. And this fall, we, I knew to get to where I wanted to be, we're gonna have to, to focus more on the quality aspect. So we, I wanted to hand pick it because number one, it gave us the ultimate quality. Number two, it gives you so many more options. Now with the husk on, we can eventually make tamales or decorations or all this stuff. But the funnest part is through Facebook ad, the one day I kind of got connected to this young gentleman, John Carrera, that uh, now with the open pollinated corns, we actually have tortillas coming and chips. So if you ever come up here to have a beer, we can even have tacos now, but uh, kind of gonna come to the end here with uh, how something appears is always a matter of perspective. And if, I'm gonna jump to the end here. So, but th this this is where we're at right now. You know, through the years, this is the perennial cover. When we talk carbon sequestration and stuff like that, this is where we're at. You know, we're we're starting to figure out how to bridge all them gaps. If you look at the the sun represents our peak carbon sequestration, we're kind of overlapping all them time frames. But uh, with that, I'm going to sign off of here. This is a flyer for this. If you want to come to our place this summer, the first event in June will be the uh, Soil Health Academy. And then uh, the week of July 19th to 23rd, we're kind of doing our annual field day week, we call it. Plus, tomorrow we're we'll meeting with No-Till Farmer on an event in September. So with that, a little long, Noah, but sorry. It's kind of hard to cut her down. Not a problem at all. Thank you so much. That was excellent. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, guys, if you do have questions, we've got about 10 minutes here. Um, well, five minutes is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, if you've got time to go five minutes extra, so I'm sure we got plenty. I'm of here questions. all night. Um, Don asks, and what are you, uh, what are you doing to increase the photosynthetic efficiency in crop fields? And I think you 
pretty much answered that. That question kind of came at the beginning. Um, but is there anything more that you would like to add on that? Uh, the biggest, biggest thing we've learned over the years is focus on that living room. And, you know, if we can keep a plant out there green, 20, you know, 365, even though, even though we get, you know, depending on the year, we might have five to six months of snow, that plant's still doing something under there. Okay. Uh, Andrew says, hi, Lauren, hope you are in shorts today, like when we met in Regina. What kind of clovers are you using in your perennial cover field? Uh, you, we've, we've tried pretty much all of them for me, the old standby is the red clover, you know, crimson clover. We've struggled with a little bit on the inner seating. It comes on strong, but if you see it flower in the fall, it's done. So, you know, it's not going to overwinter. We've tried balsana clover, you know, that whole organic plot where I showed where we frost seeded, we, we tried 10 different clovers that year. And for us in our climate, it comes down to red clover. But the key is red clover grows here naturally. So, you know, if, when I used to farm a state ground down there, we could have a pure alfalfa stand. And within four years, it was solid clover. Okay. Uh, when is your field day in July and where can people sign up? Uh, be watching multi-cropping Iowa. And uh, it, it's coming together yet. Like I said, we're, we're going to have uh, Rick Clark. Uh, hopefully Adam Daughtry shows up. I got a young gentleman from uh, Delaware that spoke at the no-till conference. He's going to be here. Biggest deal is Thursday, bring your kids. If you're coming, we're going to be at the county fair, which is only a mile east of my place here. But uh, the 4-H kids are going to have a event, hopefully, down at the fairgrounds live. Okay. Uh, Doug asked, what header setup worked best for your bean and wheat relay? Uh, the, the 1253A is by far superior. I mean, that's, that's the holy grail right there, I guess. I mean, it, it just works. And, uh, you know, but don't start there. You know, don't go out tomorrow and buy a 1253A. You know, start the, the pushers do good enough to get you from point A to point B. Okay. Um, you had to skip through there, I'm sure, for time on some of the biological stuff. But Stefan asks, have you ever tried using any biological amendments or vermicompost? Uh, I'm watching all the vermicompost. Bugs in a jug, anytime we've tried them, I see a loss. And I, I would just... I would say that's probably because our, our soil is kind of kicking pretty good already. And, uh, you know, the, the vermicompost and the compost teas and that, I'm seeing, I, I love what I see out of them, but some of that goes back to we're in a more wet climate. I think we can keep stuff alive. Now in the dry land stuff, that's where they seem to really be thriving. Okay. He said that he has a question. Yeah, Lauren, I just, uh, uh, again, I think people, when they look at all that stuff, <laughs> they're probably going, what does this dude sleep? But uh, I just, I had one question. I wanted you to comment on it because I, I think it's quite interesting. And a lot of your pictures where you were showing your planters, you know, the row cleaners that you had on there, you had, you had them covered in poly uh why why did you have that what what's the purpose of doing that that's kind of my version of a low disturbance row cleaner and, and it all goes back to a finger wheel rake if you watch how a finger wheel rake you know it kind of flexes back and it, it pushes the residue but it doesn't disturb the soil and you know it, I, I took one of the slides out of there that it, it really you know last spring i was having fun we were in a residue mat about three, four inches thick from a, it was a relay rice, uh, soy field. And, uh, you know, we were just pushing it apart, but you could pick it all up and there was absolutely no soil in the, in the path of the row cleaner. It just, you know, it, I, I call them self adjusting row cleaners. Okay. You know, that's just been kind of my bit, you know, we, I think 2015 is the first time I made a set and 
you know, we've, we've got them on the drill. We've got them on the planner. We've, you know, the relay planner has them on now. Yeah. So it's really more just kind of parting the residue than it is moving any yeah. on the ground. I, does it, does it keep those fingers from wrapping things up? Like if you're going through some, well, there, there's no pads. fingers on there anymore. Oh, there's no finger. It's just, it's, it was just the poly. Yeah. It's, it's solid poly. You know, the, well, if you've seen the one video there, the drill, that was, uh, that was curved time closing wheels that I salvaged to test with. And, uh, you know, if you got fingers behind there, it'll eventually it'll push holes right through. But now, with, you know, now we make a backer plate and uh, it just works. Okay. All right. Very cool. Um, on the, on the buckwheat, and, and we have people ask us this all the time too, you know, what can they intercede with soybeans and, you know, I caution them how, how very hard that is because, you know, when you harvest soybeans, you're taking all of that other stuff in. So whatever you plant, you're going to get in the tank. Yep. Most of the soybean intercropping with buckwheat that you're doing, is that on the relay cropping or have you tried that on full season soybeans as well? And do you think it would work on full season soybeans, you know, where they're going to, where they're going to grow longer than the relays maybe would? Well, th this this year was the first time we tried it in conventional soys, because we did we did you know Mother Nature threw us a curveball and we just didn't have any relay crop this year on my own. So what you see what you seen harvest in there was actually we were getting the head dialed in, and uh, you know this year I I had time and opportunity, so I went two weeks earlier than we've done in the relay. You know the relay we can it's pretty predictable, but you know. I thought, heck, you know, I, I was actually going for grain on that field. You know, I was going to try to get enough buckwheat to actually use for interseed. And uh, the only place we had uh, decent buckwheat this year was on the end rows and stuff like that. It just, you know, once them beans canopied, she choked everything off. Yeah, and that's and that's the problem. Although that that's a problem if you're wanting to really harvest that buckwheat but if you don't care you're just wanting something to add diversity yeah. to your bean crop it, it did, did the buckwheat get to a point where it flowered before it kind of got swallowed up yeah right at, right as it started flowering and i mean all my bean fields i went i made the outside 30 feet so all all my bean fields had a ring around them but uh it was there but you know i think it was there just enough to to draw in the beneficials because we had no bugs in the beans or anything again so yeah. so so really if you didn't want to mess with trying to clean your buckwheat out of your soybeans that was an ideal situation yeah yeah and you know like i said you know we switched herbicide programs and that so i don't know if that you know i don't know if that affected you know i've had a few guys try to tell me now liberty actually has some residual effect <laughs> hmm. yeah i never thought of it but yeah and, uh, kind of along that same lines, Mark um, asked, are you worried about weed bounce back over time? Weed seed counts increasing the farther you get from residual pesticide use. Uh, actually, we're not reducing, you know, on that row band, we're not using a reduced rate. We're probably actually higher than label. But uh, with, with the ability to manage in between the rows there, we don't have a weed issue. You know, the biggest thing is that you can't disturb the soil. And the more you disturb the soil, the more weeds you're going to fight. And that, that's a couple more of them slides that I had to take out to try to squeeze down to half hour, 45 minutes is, you know, that, that's where the duo seed really comes in. You know, it, it's your traditional deer op double disc opener is a seven degree opener. I think the new ones are seven and a half, but duo seeds down to six degree or the uh you know deer 750 drill is i think seven in, or seven degree opener so but the key to the double disc is you're only moving three degrees either way so you're not moving a lot of soil and okay uh kenneth says i may have missed it but could you mention again your planting and termination date uh for winter rye uh cereal rye <laughs> on a perfect year we're not going to terminate it i mean it's going to go to to all the way to the relay but uh you know june 1st is probably the earliest i'll terminate it just we we tend to get a wet spell from 
last two weeks of May till the first week of June, we're usually getting drowned out. So I want to keep that rye alive as long as I can. You know, and then if we got a good enough stand, I'm going to take it all the way to grain. But if, if it looks like we're going to miss grains, that's when we'll terminate. Hey, Lauren, have you tried, and I know a number of people have, have you tried planting your beans into that rye at the boot stage and then rolling the rye, you know, at anthesis, you know, when those beans are, you know, what, four, six, eight inches tall? Have you, have you done that? Yeah, that's the one video. That's what it was. Okay. I mean, yeah, that, that, it, the beans were in there about six inches tall, and with that inner roller, we're not even touching the beans. Or, you know, mo most guys running a solid roller, or, you know, they're rolling the beans and everything. Yeah, but have you done it where it's all planted together and you are rolling over the beans? Yeah. And well, that, no. I, we, we did that way back, and I won't do it again, I guess. I'll put it that way. Okay. You, you yeah. felt like you damaged the beans a little bit? Yeah, well, and I know Rick Clark, when I was at his this summer, he had kind of a gooseneck thing going on, and you know that that's why that's why I kind of had the mindset with the interroll roller. Yeah, and, to, do, to know, do it in between the rows of beans. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any issues? Uh, you mentioned the open pollinated corn. One of the biggest reasons people say that they're not able to grow anything else is because of the markets. So as you continue to grow that product um are you concerned about marketing that and the capabilities of actually handling uh, huge quantities of that or are you not really concerned it's something we got to grow into you know that that's that's what a lot of this stuff you got to grow into it and build build you know we've kind of got to the point where we built our reputation up people know about it now you know we're working with breweries and distilleries and stuff like that now it's going to take a while for them to develop even more, you know, because, yeah, the one brewery, you know, if they take a pro box of corn, that's a big deal to them. Mm -hmm. But it, it's going to take time to build into it. I mean, that's kind of my play hobby. And, uh, you know, the, the, the tortillas, you know, I, we handpicked 300 bushel of corn. I promised all that to him. And, uh, you know, once he showed up, but that, that's a year of production for him right now. But uh, he's he's been doing it all by hand. Now, after we talked to, you know, we met with him and talked to him, he's gonna automate and uh, went from, he was gonna buy a $700 tortilla press to a $13,000 one, I think. <laughs> so he's, he's gonna be fully automated. And, you know, I think I heard the number 10,000 a month, I think is what he's shooting for, so. Well, wow. can people buy those online? Oh, uh, that's going to be coming. I mean, he, he's kind of, he's kind of building from scratch. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people would be interested in that. So let us know if yeah. he gets the offer knows we can let people know. Yeah. Well, if you come to our field days, he's going to be cooking for the field days. So <laughs> well, there you go. Well, that, that's, that's the beauty. He's a trained chef and everything. And I mean, oh, it, it's that's just, nice. That's you know, so, right there, folks. Yeah, I mean, that that's the people we need to be reaching out to really start making this stuff all work and click. And, you know, that's that's the future. If you're really going to focus on some of this, you got to develop the markets. You know, he caught my attention when he told me the organic hand-picked corn that he's using currently for tortillas is $50 a bushel. <laughs> hand-picked, hand-shelled. I told him I'd do it for 25. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mercy. Yeah, that's, 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 one of those, that's one of those deals. You know, I made it known about six months ago. I, I told everybody I wanted to kind of eventually turn this joint into a research education farm. You know, we want to start with that Ag Launch 365. We want to start doing the mentorship program. Well, we're, we're kind of grabbing him and helping him out now you know, yesterday I signed the lease on the greenhouse. We got a guy taking over. He's going to resurrect the greenhouse, bring that back. He, these are two guys that never grew up on a farm, but they've got the regenerative mindset. Yeah. You know, they, they're, they're, they're kind of like the Russell Hedricks in their infancy. You know, they, they just, they don't have the, the preconceived notions of that. They're just, it's fun to work with guys like that. And like I said, that's what I want to focus on now, you know, on the side, that's, that's the fun part. 
We've got a, uh, I'll probably just do these last two questions and then we'll wrap up here. Kenneth asks, any issues with neighboring fields and your open pollinated corn? Uh, the biggest thing with open pollinated corn is, you know, we, we've been waiting to plant it till last, but now, you know, I'm going to switch it to the fields with some trees around it just for the simple fact it helps us with isolation and stuff like that. Okay. And Duncan asked, how do you deal with compaction? With the controlled traffic and the cover crops, it's a non-issue. I yep. mean, that, that's, that goes back to that living rut. I mean, it's it's real. It works. You know, that, that one slide I had showed our bulk soil densities. And, you know, every, every time we've taken them, we're down in that one range. And uh, 1.6 is rut restricting. Your average is 1.2 to 1.4. So... Mm. Okay, I lied. We're going to do this last one. How about any fungal amendments uh, like the Johnson Sioux bioreactor? That uh, kind of goes back to what we talked about. You know, the I'm, I'm watching all that stuff. You know, I'm, I'm going to wait for Chris Teach out and Michael Thompson to get it perfected, and then I'm just going to get it from them. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I want to see it working at scale. You know, Derek Axton, you know, they're, they're doing it on broad acres but that's a dry climate, you know, where I'm at, you know, it seems we have the fungal component in that going already. So, you know, a lot, a lot of our fields, you see the mushrooms and stuff like that out there. So I'd say that's a pretty good indicator. And, you know, when Jill Clapperton was here, we were looking for mycorrhizae fungi back in 2015 already. So, you know, it, it's one of those deals. If you can keep it alive, you don't need to keep adding it is my mindset. Sure. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for your time. I uh, appreciate that and answering these questions here at the end. Uh, again, if you guys I'm have tempted to go straight to Q&A, so. <laughs> I'm sure we could have uh, picked your brain for an hour at least. But if you do have any other questions that we did not get answered, um, is it fine if people email you there? Yeah, sure. I mean, you'll, you'll get a response about five o'clock in the morning usually, so. <laughs> there you go. That's when I get up and check my emails and stuff like that. And, and if you want to talk to me direct, text me first, usually is what I tell people. Cause you know, it, it's like today I had calls from New Jersey and all over and I don't need warranty. I don't need a hotel, all that wonderful stuff. So <laughs> no, no extended warranty on your car. You're saying, yeah, no, we don't need okay. any of that. All right. Well, thank you guys so much uh, for tuning in. Lauren, again, thank you for your time next Sorry week. For Russian. <laughs> no, you're fine. I thought it was great. Uh, we did record this. So for those of you that want to share this uh, with friends or watch it again, um, I'll have that posted here probably on Thursday. And then next week, I believe it's Rob Myers. Uh, no, sorry. Mike uh, is going to be on here to talk about... I should have had that prepared, but I thought it was Rob Myers. <laughs> Mike will be on next well, week. You had, you had me between smart guys, so. No, not at all. Everybody everybody that we've had on so far has been on a very high level. So I'm looking forward to, to what Mike's going to talk about next week. And then to tease that, uh, we do have a webinar series with Christine Jones that we're going to have uh, in April. So we don't have all the details figured out on that yet, but be looking for more information as well. Uh, Lauren, thanks again. Do you have any final words for us before you head out? I'm ready to go for more questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for your willingness to share your story with people and yeah, for your willingness to answer questions. So we appreciate it. Thank you, Keith. And thank you, Lauren. We'll see you guys all next week. Thanks.